Hello and welcome to the Keeper of the Home podcast. I'm Cami, creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Tidbits and Company. I'm excited to have you join me today as we talk about health for homemakers and I share a bit of my health journey with you. To start it off, I have a joke for you. How do you know if someone is into health and wellness? The answer is they will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and that is because we get a little passionate about this topic because oftentimes we have a whole lot of experience to back it up and we want to shout it on the rooftops about everything we've learned and how we feel that you can improve your life and what you can do to focus on your health and wellness because it is oh so important. So I'm here today to tell you my journey and why I think health and wellness is really important for the keeper of the home and what a blessing it can be for you and for the others in your home. I also want to share some of the perhaps more difficult parts that you may not think about as you begin or continue on a journey for better health. There can be some tricky things to navigate, so I will share some of my experience there with you for you to learn from. And then I'll just end this podcast with some tips for you to take with you on your own health and wellness journey. Now, before we get into it, let's cover a few matters of housekeeping. I was really excited to get on here and tell you about my friend Andrea. She blogs and has a YouTube channel over at Pine and Prospect Home. She is a dear, dear friend, a real life friend, one of those friends that I get together with every year. Her and I actually continue to talk all throughout the year, especially on matters of religion and faith. It is so wonderful and uplifting. But I was really excited because she has been working so hard on a homemaking course. It's called The Heart of Homemaking. I believe I got that right. <laughs> I will leave a link for you in the description or the show notes for you to check out. But I was so excited that she worked on this course and just released it because I knew it would be very relevant for you. And I knew that you would thoroughly enjoy learning about it. So please hop over and check out her course, The Heart of Homemaking. And I think she is the perfect person in this world to really teach us homemaking skills, but also just embody the beauty and the joy that is included as being the keeper of the home. So I really wanted to share that with you and give her a little shout out and point you her direction. If you're just really needing a little more motivation, inspiration, ideas, and instruction in all matters of homemaking, I think you'll absolutely love her course. Now, there are some things that I'm just sharing on the blog this week that I wanted to bring up for you so you don't miss it. And that is a lot of Valentine's content. <laughs> We're at the new year and I am actually just obsessed with Valentine's Day. I love Valentine's Day. I love the opportunity to just show some love for my family and friends and dear ones. So I love to create Valentine's content to share with you. I've got a healthy Valentine's, oh, sorry, not Valentine's, but a healthy chocolate cake-like brownies recipe for you that you can make for Valentine's. So along the lines of this healthy podcast, there are options to cook yummy treats that are better for you. And I have that recipe for you on my blog. I've also shared with you multiple, and there's more coming, but class Valentine's printables and free ideas for you. And what I actually like to do every year is come up with a Valentine's idea that you can just print off, buy whatever product works for it, the cute little saying on the Valentine's, and offer your kids or <laughs> whoever you wanna give these Valentine's to a cute Valentine's idea that does not include candy. So for many, many years, I've shared these non-candy class Valentine's ideas and printables with you. And I kind of went over and above this year. I had so many fun ideas. So I'm launching six new ones, but there's a whole archive of really fun ideas of these class Valentine's for you. So these are great if you've got kids and they have to pass out, you know, class Valentine's or if they have friends that they want to deliver a cute little Valentine's to. But also if you have like grandkids or even for your own kids, these are really fun ideas, a little non-traditional. 
in the sense of, you know, the, the little valentines that you buy from the supermarkets or a little treat. They're just just these really fun ideas with something that's maybe a little more substantial and not just garbage <laughs> to include with this valentine. So I hope you'll check that out on the blog at tidbitsandcompany.com. And if you missed it on my YouTube channel, I gave a tour of an Airbnb that we stayed at recently that was absolutely darling. And I actually thought it was just an old farmhouse, but reading the comments from this YouTube video, y'all are letting me know that this home was like a Cape Cod style, which I, I'd heard about, but I thought it was more along like coastal decor style. And we were definitely not on the coast. But um, if you love that style, kind of old home Cape Cod, I think you'll really, really love touring this Airbnb with me. And I had fun sharing it with you. All right, that is enough housekeeping items <laughs> to keep you busy today. You know I've got to begin a podcast, especially one about health and wellness, with a disclaimer. <laughs> I always feel like I need to do this, but this is most important. Friends, I am not a doctor. I am not a trained physician. Um, everything I've learned has been through my own experience and research. So please don't take anything I say for gospel, if you will, <laughs> but do your own research. I'm just here to offer you a perspective on health and wellness that I hope will assist you on your own journey. So that is a very important disclaimer, but also I just wanna let you know that I'm actually really uncomfortable with this topic <laughs> and sharing my thoughts. It feels very vulnerable. I'm super opinionated, as you might get to see a glimpse of as I begin to talk, and I'm always afraid of judgment in these matters because, of course, I am not perfect in the world of health and wellness, and I guess it just makes me a little nervous about what others might think as I talk about this, especially people that know me in my real life, <laughs> but um, I also feel kind of vulnerable because well, I guess just to say it blunt, bluntly, I don't feel like I am a picture of health and wellness. <laughs> um, normally when you think of someone that's really into this, you know, their physique is lean and strong and fit. And if I'm being honest, that that is not how I view myself <laughs> or my physique. And also my husband is a big guy. And so I've been really hesitant to even talk about this because I guess... I guess in truth, I'm afraid of that judgment, even though I like to feel like I'm a person who doesn't really care what other people think, but I guess it's there to some degree. So I just wanna come up here and just let you know that I feel a little vulnerable talking about this, but also maybe this offers you some hope <laughs> if you're also feeling the same struggles as you talk to others about health and wellness or view yourself. Um, in all honesty, both my husband and I are up against a lot of genetics <laughs> that um, might prevent us from being that, you know, that, that perfect image or pillar of health and wellness. And if we both look at our genetics and our ancestors, um, I think we're doing pretty good with where we're at. There's always room for improvement, but I know that if I don't deliberately act on our health and wellness, I know by our history that there are things that would not be avoidable, such things as heart attacks, heart disease, diabetes, um, obesity, aches and pains, every surgery you can imagine. <laughs> like if I am not active in pursuing a healthier lifestyle, I may not ever be the super thin <laughs> person that you might envision who is passionate about health and wellness. But let me tell you, we feel good, we feel good about where we're at and we're doing pretty darn good if you consider our genetics. So in that sense, I'm very pleased with where we're at and um, I don't know why I feel like I needed to tell you that, but hopefully it was actually encouraging that you can be passionate about health and wellness and not be the Pinterest image of what you might view as someone who is into such things. So hopefully that is a little encouraging um, and it's especially important to just consider how you actually feel inside your skin and feel about your future health. So that's what's been really important 
for me as I've pursued this journey to not get hung up on the outside appearance. And I say this next thing not to be judgmental, it's just an observation that I have made. Um, even though I'm not <laughs> as maybe um, lean as I would love to be, or maybe the number on the scale isn't where I would want it to be, I'm actually always so surprised. I can be with friends or family who are actually that picture of health, who are maybe at an ideal weight from my perspective. And um, I can listen to them and hear of their struggles. And the reality is that they don't feel good. A lot of times when I'm watching what they eat or their lifestyle, I stand in amazement because they don't struggle with weight <laughs> like I do, but they are sick and their bodies are telling them something isn't right, but they can get away with eating, you know, all the soda, all the candy, and doing all the things that I've worked really hard to change in my life, and yet they are still um, at a more comfortable weight than I would maybe view myself at. But I have to take into account of how they feel, what kind of health challenges they're dealing with, and that often offers me some perspective because I am not dealing with those anymore, even though I would like to use, lose, you know, 10 or 20 pounds. <laughs> really, you have to consider what is most important and how you feel. And without being judgmental of others, just understand that um, the pursuit of health is definitely worth it. And health is not always seen on the surface. So now that we've said all of that, let me share with you a quick rundown of my journey and the things that kind of were a catalyst for me into making the changes in my life that I felt were necessary. And I hope this is inspiring. Um, your journey is going to be very unique and will not be like mine. <laughs> and that is okay. I have noticed that everyone is on their own health journey, but it is something in our modern day and our modern style of living that is definitely worth paying attention to and talking to others about so that you can learn from them. So this is a journey that is like, you know, decades in the making, and I'm going to sum it up for you. Basically, my history from my youth with food and my body image were not, I would consider, very healthy. Um, I did not understand what true nourishment meant. I always was trying to achieve um, what I viewed as the perfect body shape, and it was quite an obsession for me, something I'm definitely still trying to overcome and fight. Um, but I was basically born or raised on the, you know, 90s conventional diet, and I don't want to make any judgments on my mother for this. She was a single mother because my dad passed away when I was 11, and she did the very best she could with the knowledge that she had. And quite frankly, if I'm angry at anyone, it is the messaging of the world <laughs> telling us that it is okay if your kids eat boxed mac and cheese every night for dinner, um, Velveeta poured over chips, you know, for a snack, <laughs> that it's okay to consume sugary cereals to start your day, that Pop-Tarts are a healthy choice, Nutella is nu nutritious. Um, I am just really, really angry at the world's messaging and um, what that has done for, you know, our health as a society and personally. You know, so I was raised on Hot Pockets, frozen pizzas, all the things. <laughs> and my mom did make good old home-cooked meals. I, Still to this day, nothing tastes better than her roast and potatoes, but for the majority of my upbringing, that is what nourished me, and it came with its challenges. And my sister and I would get really hung up on fad diets. There was one that would just destroyed us mentally and physically that we did when we were teenagers. Like, I think about what what that did to me. I was not overweight. I played volleyball. I was in amazing <laughs> health, but, um, well, you know, as it might appear, but we got obsessed with these fad diets that we'd hear about. One was called the body for life. And it allowed for one day of the week to just binge on or eat whatever you wanted. And the rest of the days were really strict. Well, let me tell you, we would stash up this pile on the countertop of just garbage, <laughs> you know, uh, 
man, I don't even remember they're called, like Ding Dongs and, um, oh, all those Debbie food things. That's so funny. I, Twinkies, that's what they're called. <laughs> I just used to love Twinkies. I haven't had one of those probably since, you know, college. But anyway, we would stash up all this junk food and go crazy one day of the week. It just destroyed our systems. <laughs> I feel so bad for the Cami of the past that I did that to her, but that was the messaging and I'm really frustrated by all of that and I really hope we've done better. But um, fast forward to, you know, getting married, becoming a homemaker, having been raised like that, not much changed. You know, I did bring in, you know, I married a hunter, so, you know, we had a lot of meat and stuff, and so I'd have to learn how to cook with that. But for the majority of our early years in as a newlywed and into having little littles, um, I, I just cooked probably out of a box. Lots of hamburger helper. I thought that was food from scratch. <laughs> but I just carried with me the habits of my college years and what I was raised on and didn't know any better. And what I really have to try to not beat myself up about was this was how I fed my littles. You know, all the fishy crackers, all the box crackers, cereals, um, even I, I did not receive very many positive messages about nursing them. I thought the formula in the can was better. No one taught me to look at the ingredients in that can of formula. So when things got tough with nursing, doctors just told me, well, babies do better on formula anyway. And so this was the messaging that, that I um, had in my life and I just didn't know any better. And so what was the result of this kind of lifestyle? Well, let me tell you, of course, as I've already talked about, a really unhealthy relationship with food and my body. And also I became very sick, very, very sick. By the time I'd had my fourth child, my body was, <laughs> I look back and I just think my body was probably shutting down on me. And I had really crazy symptoms. And I went to so many doctors, they couldn't explain things. They ran every test you can imagine, MRIs, EKGs, x-rays, eye exams. I went to neurological specialists, like they sent me everywhere. No answers, but I was sick and my body was, <laughs> I don't even know what my body was doing but because we couldn't explain these symptoms. It was just shutting down. And it's unfortunate, but sometimes it takes like getting to that rock bottom to realize that you've got to make some big changes. And what was really sad to me was not only was I um, falling apart physically, it impacted me mentally. By the fourth baby, you know, they call it postpartum depression, which I believe was part of it, but I got into a really bad place for a really long time with um, depression and anxiety, didn't understand why. Um, I ended up, you know, going to counseling or therapy, and this is what blows me away. <laughs> Spent all that money on therapy. Not a single word was mentioned about the food I was eating. Not a single word. They were trying to address this surface problem and maybe they didn't know, <laughs> which I'm like, why are they going to school <laughs> for so many years? But not a word was mentioned about my diet and what I was eating and um, my lifestyle, which blows me away now that I look back and I really hope that the world is waking up and becoming better at that. All right, so this is where I was from this lifestyle that I had lived for several decades. And well, I guess only a couple decades, I don't know. <laughs> I don't wanna do math here. Um, but I wanna share with you some of the things were like the wake up calls for me or the catalyst to say like, oh, maybe what I've been told my whole life isn't quite right. And maybe I could actually make some changes that would make a difference on their own. So some of the things I noticed, well, actually the first thing that kind of woke me up, it wasn't all this sickness, but I started to notice a real like chemical sensitivity. And if you've been with me for a long time, you know that I, I, I share about this. I'm always trying to come up with different ways to uh, clean our home or the products in our home or the products we're putting on our faces. But my journey started with noticing the chemicals were making me sick. Like I'd walk down the laundry detergent aisle in the grocery stores and immediately feel just 
foggy, sick, like I wanted to lay down. The other things going on were I had a couple of kids that were had a lot of eczema and diaper rashes just terrible. Like their their skin just looked horrible. And of course I went to all the dermatologists trying to figure this out. Here's what they told me to do. <laughs> Bless their heart. I really hope they know better. But this is what I was told to do with my son's eczema in particular, or eczema, however you say that. I grew up calling it eczema. They, number one, gave me steroids for this, this baby. He was under one years old when we were facing all these problems. Gave me steroids for him, steroid creams, and told me to bath my baby in bleach. <laughs> <laughs> Not like full bleach, but to put bleach in his bath water. And I'm sure they explained the reasons for that, which just boggles my mind. But I actually, this was kind of the wake up call because I grew up or, or was taught to clean everything with bleach. When the sink, the kitchen sink got all gross, you just dump bleach in there, scrub it around. That's how you clean your bathtubs. That's how you can clean the surfaces. That's what you do to get your clothes white. Like I knew bleach. I used bleach all the time. So in my mind, okay, let's bath our baby in bleach. <laughs> um, what ended up happening was, it was the wake up call I started to notice when I bathed my baby, I felt really, really sick. And oddly enough, when I cleaned the kitchen sink, I felt really, really sick. And I would have to like lie down and I would get these migraines and headaches. And so that was kind of the wake up call that oh, there's something I'm using in my home <laughs> that is not good for me. And that propelled a whole big journey that basically that started it was trying to clean up my products, finding and discovering blogs and books and things that talked about the chemicals in our products. And I, I just went crazy um, substituting those things. And I noticed results right away. I noticed what made me feel better. And if I would try to use, you know, like go and get a really yummy scent of lotion or foaming hand soap, I would notice right away it would make me itch. Um, if I used a laundry detergent that had, you know, colorants and fragrances, that's when the diaper rash for my kids would happen really bad. I used, I had been trying cloth diapers at the time, just trying to get rid of her diaper rash. But I noticed very quickly that those products were impacting my health and it kind of woke me up and got me considering other things. And the other thing <laughs> was our food. And let me tell you, I feel like in this world, we are up against a lot with what's in our water, um, what's in our air, what's in our products. You know, we're bombarded by this stuff, whether or not we can, we can change it or not. But um, when you change your food, <laughs> it has a massive impact. So I hope that's encouraging that even though we live in this modern world that may be against our health, if we focus on our food, it can have a very dramatic effect on everything. So before I started thinking about this podcast, I really tried to think back on what was it that actually changed my perspective on food? And I can track it back to very specific <laughs> movie we watched. And I don't know how I ran into it. Maybe it was someone that mentioned something on social media. I don't know, but it was the documentary called Food Inc, like incorporated. And I think it's still available um, on Amazon or probably just Amazon. I don't know, but Food Inc. And I watched it and I tried to go into it with an open mind, like, oh, you know, they're probably just I'm just trying to scare you and stuff, but what ended up happening, both my husband and I watched it and we were blown away with what we were learning and seeing. And it created a lot of questions in our mind. Like, is this real? Like, is that really what the chicken farms look like? Is that really how our meat is being raised? Is that really what the food looks like in the labs like that's not even food and <laughs> it just created and drummed up a lot of curiosity that propelled me to just dive deeper and I ended up running into um, a blog called 100 days of real food and she had created three cookbooks and I don't know why, but I just, I was really overwhelmed with this thought of like, well, what is real food? I thought I was eating real food. 
and just viewing her blog. And I'm just so grateful for, for bloggers. <laughs> I know I'm one of them, but especially for bloggers that are talking and educating on these things, I'm so grateful for them to fight the messaging with, um, with the things that are going to be beneficial for us. So I, I really got obsessed with the 100 Days of Real Food blog and challenge and her cookbooks. And I just started like, just started to try to cook from them. Just started to try to use only these few cookbooks that I got to plan my meals and my snacks. And it was fun. It was different. My kids hadn't really seen me cooking that much from scratch. And so it was intriguing for them. Um, of course, we had to get used to things that were less sugary and less sweet and vegetables, you know. So it, it came with its challenges as you're trying to retrain your palate to eat real food. But it really was actually very helpful to just have one simple resource to follow and to try to make these big changes. I remember I further ran into the blogger and the cookbook from Wellness Mama. Um, she does a lot of great work. But I remember getting her cookbook because I wanted more sources for just real food recipes without the overwhelm of the internet. That was important for me because I easily get overwhelmed <laughs> by stuff like this. But I remember just reading the introduction to the Wellness Mama cookbook and just like realizing what is in our oils and basically what are the oils made of and then what foods have these processed oils and it just opened my mind, blew my mind and then helped me to, to like just focus on like, okay, how can I swap out the oils in our home or, or what kind of products are there that use better oils? And that made a really big difference. So I was just learning small and simple principles and trying to change them slowly. But probably one of the biggest things that had the, the quickest impact or visual <laughs> impact that you could really feel and see was um, sugar. And my sister, Marcy, she blogs over at instafreshmills.com, has some really great recipes for the Instant Pot that are super healthy and delicious. But anyway, so she noticed probably before me that sugar was making her very sick. She had her own health challenges to try to sort through and she pinned down sugar. And what's funny is she was like the baker extraordinaire of our family when we got together as, you know, extended family with, with my siblings and my mom and such. Like she brought the most beautiful desserts and she was the baking queen. Well, all of a sudden she stopped doing that. And <laughs> she told us all she was not eating sugar. She did like this sugar-free program for a year and it just changed her health completely. Of course, we were all disappointed, but instead of bringing these beautiful desserts, she started to bring like real food, you know, sides and meals and exposing us <laughs> to how delicious real food tastes. And I really have to thank her for helping me on this journey because before that, real food did not taste that great. I was struggling with trying to feel like it tasted good, but she showed me how incredible the flavors can be when you cook with real food and spices and seasonings. And like, I was just blown away. And that's about the time when we did our cookbook together, the Master the Electric Pressure Cooker cookbook. And she would bring these foods for me to photograph for our cookbook, which you can get on Amazon, by the way, or in an ebook form. I'll leave a link for that. But she would bring over these meals for me to photograph for the cookbook and then, you know, allow me to eat them. And I was just like, oh, this food tastes so good. <laughs> so she taught me that real food tastes amazing. And that was very important to my journey. Um, I would say that it's it's really difficult to get your kids on this on this um train, I guess I should say, on board. Because if you raise them on processed foods and that becomes their taste palette, it is so difficult. And I am still fighting it. Still, after so many years of just cooking with real food, it is so difficult to live in this world and the food that bombards our kids and the treats and the snacks to, to teach them, to teach their palate to like real food, that is way more difficult than it is for adults. And so I wish, I wish I could go back and start them young, but you can't go back. So we're just moving forward. But if that just helps give you some, 
some support there. It's difficult, but it's worth the journey. And slowly, slowly, you will start to see their taste buds change and you will start to see them recognize how much better they feel when they eat real food. And as I'm trying to think back of how this journey to cooking real food and cooking with real food unfolded, I would, I recall like just thinking, okay, it's too overwhelming to think of every meal and every snack. So I'm just gonna figure out how to make breakfasts for my kids with real food. Let's start there. And then let's venture into snacks that I can make and have on hand that are real food and good for them. And then we ventured into dinners. And so it was really not all at once. That would be way too overwhelming, especially when you've got the history that I have. But just starting small and slowly training yourself how to, to do this. I remember someone once telling me to just only shop on the outside of the grocery stores. Don't go down the aisles. <laughs> Avoid the aisles um, because most of the time they're, they're canned processed foods that, um, you know, have a shelf life of well over a year. But if you, you just shop around the aisles for the fresh dairy, fresh vegetables, fresh produce and meats, that's a really good place to start to just get your food around there. Now all this eventually moved to learning more and more and more, and I'm not done learning, but this journey has led us to being passionate about growing our own food. We are just so excited about the garden that we're cultivating and want to do more and more and more. <laughs> We now raise our own animals. My husband raises us his own meat that is fully grass fed from start to finish. Um, we even try as hard as we can to buy only organic and really make the most out of sources like Azure Standard. I will leave a link for them as well where you can get bulk foods that are organic and sourced really well. Um, we buy in bulk, we mill our own grains. Like we're just, Every year we're starting to learn more and more things about how to be self-sufficient with our food and also how to get just the best quality of food we can get with the most nourishment for our bodies. And that is, that is such a priori priority in our lives, like top one of the top priorities that we really feel is worth our money and our time above just about anything else on the budget. So it's such a priority. And the more we get into it, we the more we see the benefits of prioritizing that. Okay, I could I should probably have just done a whole podcast on food, but I just want to move on quickly to um, like mental health and stress because that was also a big part of my journey and some of the things that I, I changed the most to make a big difference outside of, you know, food. But I remember when I was going through that time of, you know, all the doctor's appointments, all the testing, my sister Marcy actually worked as a nurse practitioner. And so we would, I would go in and that doctor was the one that kind of pointed me to, the, to all the stuff to do. And I don't know why he didn't just come out and tell me <laughs> straightforward, but he told my sister, which was such a blessing to have, you know, my sister worked directly with him, but he commented to her that I was suffering from anxiety. And, you know, when she told me that, I'm like, oh, what? I don't have anxiety. I don't feel anxious. But in reality, that anxiety was just playing out in my whole body. And I could, I can totally see now that I, I was living in the state of chronic stress and anxiety, and it was doing an absolute number on my body, especially combined with the food I was eating. And this was a season of life where, you know, I had four kids. I um, was thinking I was done because the four to get there was extremely difficult. That is one thing I wish I could go back to experiment with is my pregnancies were so hard, but if I look back on what I was eating, I wonder if I would have felt better, if I would have actually given my body the nourishment that it was desperately needing as I was trying to raise these babies in my, in my body. But looking back on that time, I was, I was becoming this businesswoman and growing my blog, and that became consuming for me and exciting for me, especially because her budget was so tight and I, I really felt I needed to find a way to relieve that burden from my husband. So in turn, I became this businesswoman. I would stay up way, way late 
and then tr then have to get up at night or get up early with babies. I was not getting the sleep I needed and my lifestyle was just wreaking havoc on my health. And I look at that and I think, oh sure, I, uh, I grew a business all well and good, <laughs> but at what cost? And you really have to consider is wealth or health most important to you? Because if, it, if achieving wealth and success is a priority over your health, you will quickly see the ramifications of that decision and they won't be good. And it is very important to find a balance in that thing and to realize, <laughs> you know, what is wealth if our health is just absolutely terrible to where we can't even enjoy our wealth to the fullest. So, so that is a very important thing for you to ask yourself. But I took such great pride in this busyness, you know, that I was this mom of four kids. I was so busy and there was no pride to be had in that. That is not something I am proud of anymore. I don't take pride in being super busy. I do everything I can to cut back in my life so I'm not super busy so that I have time to relax and to be with my kids and enjoy them. I'm not saying I'm perfect at that, but it's a really important thing to think about and pursue. Um, now I have found things that really help with my stress levels because life is stressful at times, no matter what you're trying to do. And for me to, to keep myself mentally healthy, yoga was one of the most life-changing things that I discovered. I love the Yoga with Adrienne ch uh, channel. Love it. It's free. She is so generous and it has just been so impactful to... Yoga, there's a science to yoga that once you understand will blow your mind, but also you feel the mental benefits of yoga right away as it just releases stress from your body, calms your muscles down, and that impacts so, so much. And we have definitely gone into um, having a sauna and reaping the benefits of that, which are huge mentally. It also helps me so I don't feel puffy and inflamed. Super good for your skin. There are so many benefits to saunaing. Is that a word? Saunaing? <laughs> but also trying to work really hard and improve my relationship with my body and the size and the shape and the age that I'm in has been very impactful and just helping my health overall. But I want to quickly tell you about something that has just absolutely transformed how I think about mental health. And we, I think we all are aware of the mental health crisis facing our world these days. And there are many, many reasons for that. I'm not going to pretend I know all the answers, but there we've had an experience in our home lately that has really opened my eyes. And it started, um, oh, she doesn't mind me sharing this, but my older daughter was struggling herself with, with depression. And it seemed to be getting worse. And she would just get caught in these this like victimized mentality that was really confusing to me because that's not who she is. She is such a beacon of joy and happiness and I could see her kind of spiraling down. Now she also really struggles with acne and I have avoided, you know, all the harsh medicines because I've, I've seen what they do for people. Um, they may help short term, but they wreak havoc <laughs> long term. And so in an effort to avoid those, I was learning about more about like the gut and how that affects our skin, like eczema and acne and rashes. Like if you have those kind of skin infla inflammatory conditions, they're actually a huge blessing in telling your body something is going on inside, but we ignore them and we try to try to treat them topically and it doesn't work. <laughs> So anyway, I started learning about this and I ran into a podcast, one of my favorite, favorite podcasts that I, I really hope you go and discover after I talk to you here, or even just stop my podcast and go listen because I feel like it's more valuable. But there's a podcast called Just Ingredients. And um, there was one episode that I listened to um, recently that just blew my mind. I mean, I've been on this health journey. We've made so many changes, but yet we were still struggling with this mental health for my daughter. And I listened to episode 115 of Just Ingredients podcast, and it's called the brain, how brain inflammation is affecting our kids' health. And even if you don't have kids, if you even want to learn this for yourself, Highly, highly recommend. I feel like this podcast episode with this Dr. Red interview 
is one of the most important things for us to learn right now. It was chock full of information that we absolutely need if we're gonna stand a chance in this modern world or if our kids will even stand a chance of growing up normally with, a, with you know, good mental health. But this episode blew my mind from everything from acne, eczema, ADHD, depression, anxiety, it all has to do with our lifestyle and our foods. And um, you just have to listen to it. <laughs> you just have to. It is so, so informative. Well, in this episode, um, I learned how the foods that we were probably eating were, were affecting the brain and the inflammation in the brain causing these things. And I actually had my daughter listen to it. And even in spite of huge changes we've made in our home, you know, she would go out and be bombarded. Um, she takes a couple classes at the, at the local high school. She has church groups, you know, whatever. The youth are just bombarded with junk food. And we started to wonder if gluten was a culprit for her. I could tell by what I was learning and observing in her, we had inflammation issues within her body. And so we wanted to try just gluten. If we could get rid of gluten, what would that do? And, you know, I make my own breads. <laughs> I buy organic wheat, but still, if your body's in the state of inflammation, um, that can still be harmful. So we started to try to take out gluten. I gotta give this girl some grace. It is hard in this world to try to do stuff like this when you're surrounded by gluten. And it was amazing what we have witnessed in the last few months. The difference that made in her mental health was astonishing and almost instant she started to realize that like on days that she was really good and vigilant, she, she would make comments like, oh, I, I can't believe, like I was just so used to at the end of the day feeling sick. And we noticed her feeling happier, like so much happier and feeling good and motivated and just herself was coming out again. And this just amazed me. And if she goes and like, like the other day she went babysitting she was super busy that day, didn't have time to, for us to prepare a dinner and at babysitting, they gave her pizza well, immediately. She feels foggy, sick, and it has an impact for several days. For several days, she's in this, <laughs> she calls it her victim mentality. She just can't get out of her head and feels picked on and a target and a victim for everything. And you can just see her mentally spiral down. And it has just opened my eyes to be like, what are we feeding these kids? and ourselves that is actually either the cause or greatly contributing to this mental health problem. So I could go on a whole rant here, but I won't. I will direct you to go listen to that podcast and listen to it with an open heart and open mind because it has, the application of it has greatly impacted our life and we're gonna just keep trying other things. Oh, and her skin was clearing up almost instantly we could see a change within a week of you know trying to cut this out her skin is clearing up and it's just it's it's almost miraculous to me but also sad that our food is affecting us that much and we don't even know it okay let me talk quickly about movement movement is very important for our bodies one of the biggest things that has impacted me mostly mentally is a daily walk getting outside getting fresh air um, I live for it. My soul just craves it. In fact, right now, it's like my walk time and I can't wait to get this podcast done to get outside. Um, it's really, really good for me mentally and physically. Um, strength training is important. Try to fit that in two or three times a week. Um, but I have noticed as I'm getting older, I am more prone to injury. My knees, my shoulders, if I'm doing too vigorous of strength training, I start to get injured and then I can't do it solely because it hurts too much. So, um, you know, we have to learn what our bodies can do, what stages we're in, and to be careful there. I know many of you might have suggestions for me. I would love your help finding movement that is gentle and yet effective at building muscle and strengthening us as we age. So if you have some suggestions there for me, I am all ears. Another huge part of my health journey was in medicine. I am grateful for modern medicine. I don't want to be someone who knocks it down. I am very grateful for what we know there, but I also feel like, 
Um, maybe we're relying on it too much for our health. Of course, food is medicine, right? <laughs> but I have been on a journey learning about herbs and using herbs as medicine or preventative medicine and have just loved this journey. You only, it only takes like one really positive and impactful experience with herbs to just blow your mind. And then you're all in and you can't get enough. <laughs> that is my experience. Um, I started to learn about dandelions. I have a dandelion self recipe on my blog and other content to talk, to teach you about dandelions. But that was kind of like the first herb, believe it or not, that is a very powerful herb that just blew my mind. I could not believe the impact <laughs> that it had on our lives. And it's just been, I wanted to say downward spiral, but uphill adventure <laughs> in learning about herbs and discovering their benefits and really experiencing the benefits. And for me, I don't have time to go back to school, even though that's what I would now, you know, like to be when I grow up as an herbalist. But instead, I am taking courses and classes from Herbal Academy online. If you want to learn about herbs, highly, highly recommend. They have a course in just about everything you can imagine from skincare to medicine, um, to making tinctures and salves, you name it. You can learn it at herbalacademy.com. Um, I will actually leave a link for you in the description um, to point you to the courses that I've taken and have really enjoyed. So anyway, a little plug there about that part of my health journey. Now, if you're a homemaker, or the keeper of your home and keeper of the hearts in your home, I hope you have already begun to see how impactful these kind of changes can make in your home. But um, I wanna just sum up what have these ch changes actually done in our lives that they could do for you as a homemaker. And I always think of the scripture um, that you should run and not be weary, walk and not faint. I just feel good. I feel really good. We haven't been to doctors in years um, and I just feel great. I wake up and pop out of bed, feel great, don't deal with headaches. I haven't taken ibuprofen or Tylenol since I got COVID, um, you know, in 2020 when those aches were so bad I could hardly bear it. But like, I just feel good and I have options to take care of my body if I'm ever sick or need it. And that alone, I mean, what else do you need to just feel good? But, but there is the benefit of um, not having medical bills. I cannot believe how rarely we go to the doctor. And I'm grateful that it's there for if we need it, especially for like emergencies. But, you know, when you just feel good, you don't have to spend your income on the doctors. And I heard at once that the majority of Americans' income is spent on health care. And um, for us, the majority of our income is spent on food. <laughs> so, you know, pick, pick where you wanna spend your money, um, but living a healthier lifestyle and investing in good food will actually kind of make that decision for you most of the time. <laughs> I know there are things out of our control, but I, I really feel empowered. I feel empowered because I can see um, through, you know, our, our um, genetics and parents and grandparents and siblings, I can really see the impact of good health. And I feel so much more empowered as I grow older and feel like, like I've really given myself a leg up by focusing on this in our lives. Yes, health and wellness can be consuming. Um, but of course we read in the scriptures by the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat thy bread. And it is so important for us to focus on this. It is almost, you know, one of the biggest purposes of life is to eat and to nourish. And it's so important. And it's even more important when we get it right. So it's worth how much time and effort it takes and it can become such a great joy in your life when you discover the benefits that it's not drudgery to make those meals from scratch. It's not a pain to spend all your money at the grocery store on the good foods or to grow your own garden and the effort that that takes, you really begin to see the benefits and it's worth it. I feel better about um, teaching the next generation about these important things and I hope that they're even better than me and I hope they teach their kids even better than I'm teaching them and I feel like this is how we're going to help this world of ours. And it's so important that we as the homemakers are the ones to teach this by example because we can't rely on the schools or we can't rely on anyone else 
to teach these important principles and to make this big of an impact. It's really going to come from our home. Now, I want to say there are some downsides, some like major downsides to this journey of health and wellness. And um, I would say one of them is you start once you're vocal about it and you let others know about it. <laughs> there is a reaction that they give you. Maybe this is just my experience. I don't know. But you can be viewed as somewhat of an extremist. And I feel like it's because when you make these changes in your life and you are vocal about it, um, it it's maybe a slap in their face or maybe it's suggesting that their way of life is not good <laughs> and people don't take to that very well. And especially when like, Maybe you're oblivious to the impacts of what you eat and how you're living. Someone's telling you that it's not okay. Um, it's really hard to accept that. And I say this with all the grace in my heart, but it is a result of, of this journey. And it has been a result for me. Um, some things have been really hard as I speak out about what we're feeding our kids in church activities or schools or, or you know, family reunions or whatever. If you become more vocal you open yourself up to being mocked or judged. And that's just a hard reality. But I think it's a battle worth fighting. I think it's an example worth setting. And I look back at like those bloggers who spoke out or my sister who had the, <laughs> the bravery to bring salads to family dinner instead of her beautiful cheesecakes. You know, those small things made such an impact in my life. And I think we can do that for others as we just try to open their eyes a little bit. And um, I guess that's what I'm trying to do here. And so if you, you've been listening to this, especially if you know me and, <laughs> and you know that I can speak out about such things, um, I, I guess it's, it's shared out of love and out of experience and that I feel like it's, it's a battle worth fighting. Another downside is, in, and I'm really trying to wade through this myself, but it can, it can be such an obsession that it becomes hard for you to actually just enjoy, you know, some of the, the things that are, that our society enjoys, like celebrations or gathering where there's all this, you know, sweets and treats. And it can be really hard to look at it and be like, it's okay if my kids eat that this time, you know, I'm doing, <laughs> you know, there's an 80 20 balance in life. I'm doing everything I can at home. It's okay. If they eat that right now, they're going to be okay. Or if it's okay, if I enjoy it this once, even though I'll probably feel sick, <laughs> but trying to not be so extreme that you can't enjoy the, some of the simple pleasures of life. Um, whether that's a dessert or, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever the thing is that you know isn't healthy, but you just want to enjoy it. It can be really hard to live in that and just to let go. And maybe that's just my personality. I've told you before, I'm kind of an all or nothing kind of person. And so it's really hard to just kind of let go and to know it'll be okay. Um, you can make other people really upset and frustrated. And then you can also be frustrated at others. It's hard for me to go to like events or to enjoy Halloween and to just see everyone just making really bad choices <laughs> from my perspective. And it's really hard to not be judgmental and to sp suppress those, those feelings and to not get frustrated at what's going on in our community over food and lifestyle. So that that is a downside, you know, for what it's worth. That's that's what I've experienced. But I do feel like a change has to start somewhere. And if we're going to continue down this path as a society, we're going to see more mental health problems, we're going to see more physical health problems, we're going to just see more of the allergies, ADHD, and all these problems that are plaguing our society, the change has to start somewhere. And usually it's not well received from the beginning. So hopefully that's encouraging, but <laughs> just prepare yourself for it as you make these changes, that it doesn't come without its challenges. So after all that, let's just sum it up and give you some takeaways, some quick tips for you to implement in your life right now. Tip number one, 
I hope this podcast is not where you stop learning. <laughs> Never ever stop learning and trying to get better and trying to improve because odds are there are always going to be small things that you can do to improve your health and wellness. So just don't stop learning. I love that Just Ingredients podcast. I love learning on Herbal Academy. I love learning about new ingredients. Like right now, especially since I feel like my daughter shouldn't be eating gluten until we figure out what's going on. I've been learning how to cook with cassava flour and almond flours and, and different options for her. And so that's fun. Like just never stop learning because there are so many amazing ingredients that we can experiment with. There are amazing things that you can do to move your body that will have an impact. There are so many things for you to learn and grow and get better at. It's, it's really a journey of a lifetime. So get excited about that. And my next tip is take it slow, especially if you're like me and you get overwhelmed quickly. When you learn about something, make slow and simple changes. And again, realize that it's a lifetime of a journey and every little change that you make can have a really big impact. Also, lead by example. You may not have everyone in your household or your friends or your coworkers be on the same page. Oftentimes when it's like an event where there's tons of treats or people are ordering desserts, I just say like, oh, that will make me so sick. And people ask why. And I can share some of this journey with them. So lead by example to try to open up everyone's eyes <laughs> to discover how we could do better. And then of course, something I'm still working on is to just accept your body right now where it's at, whether you have health problems, whether you're not the size that you want to be. Um, if we are not happy where we are at now, it just causes more stress. And if you learn about stress, you realize that that's not going to help anything. So accept how you feel. Focus on nourishment over neglect. Focus on what makes you feel good and what fuels you. And as you begin to learn more about your body and your body responds to this kind of thinking and behavior, you'll see a huge change and you'll feel good. So anyway, there's some quick tips and takeaways I hope are helpful for you. I do apologize. I thought this was going to be a quick podcast. I should have known better. This is a super passionate topic for me and I hope you've learned a few things, but let's wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining me and I will be back very soon to share more inspiration for the keeper of the home.